It's good to be together. Uh, we're doing this series called um, uh, Couldn't Stand the Weather. So it's all about seasons and stuff like that, right? So we, did, we talked about floods and we talked about droughts. And we did, um, uh, today we talked about harvests. And, the, and the, sort of the title of the, of the talk is When Everything is Good, right? So think about the moment, the moments in life that you've experienced um, that the stars aligned, um, that there's this dream job that you got, or got an A on a test that you were nervous about, right? Um, maybe you found a new friend, uh, and there's this connection uh, that you were longing for. Uh, maybe you were on a date, and the date went well. That's a good thing, right? You know, it didn't go terrible. That's a good thing. Um, small moments and, and big moments, triumphant moments, uh, moments of connections and intimacy, uh, moments where uh, just you feel that everything is good with the world. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah? By show of hands, have you ever felt that way? Yeah. At least once? <coughs> good. Uh, at least once. Um, so let me, ask, let me ask you this. Oh, how long did it last? Um, isn't it interesting that it doesn't last for a long time, usually? <laughs> and I think the reason for that is sort of a tricky title, you know, when everything is well. Because I think everything is never well, right? Just sort of the nature of things. And, uh, and I think that's what I, I was, I was going to talk about today, is that because we, we, you know, it's in our human nature to experience to sort of long for that, and actually it's a God thing, to long for the time where everything is well. Because we know in our DNA, in our spiritual DNA, that everything will be well, right? It's this foreshadowing, this feeling, this knowledge of heaven when the kingdom comes to earth and kingdom and earth come together in an unforeseen kiss. You know how, in this, how we sing it in this song that we just sang. And uh, because we expect that in our DNA, in our bones, we're wired this way, we sort of expect it in, in, this, in this life where we're still sort of on the way to the kingdom and earth coming together. And because of that, I think we can, we can miss the harvest because we keep expecting that everything will be well and everything is not well this side of heaven. Does that make sense? And, uh, and I think what, we're, what, what I want to talk about today is how do you not miss the harvest? How do you not miss it? How do you get to, uh, get to recognizing it? What is the harvest? Does that make sense? Um, let me give my notes. I don't know if the thing will, will work. Can you try? I see a song, <laughs> but let me, f let me know when it works, and I'll, um, I'll speak from my notes here. <clears throat> um, there's, this, there's this story that I heard that was just really fascinating, and it was this man, he's a baker, and um, he... He was, he, he's a baker, and he's been a baker for a long time, all his life. And, he, uh, you know, he was, many years ago, he, he uh, immigrated from the Middle East, and uh, he went to Australia, and then he has eight siblings, and his dad was a farmer, and um, he, he immigrated to Australia, and he was on a boat for 40 days to get there. And he, when he got there, he couldn't find a job, um, when he got there, he didn't speak any English. He slept in the streets. And, and, and then eventually, slowly, he made his way into a place where he is um, now an, a business owner, a baker, and, and does this thing. As he's actually now in Europe. And it's fascinating because he tells the story that um, because of what he experienced when he was a kid, because of the hunger, because of the loneliness, because of being, not being able to, to find a home even, 
at, at one point or another. This new wave of, of um, hundreds of thousands of immigrants that are, that are flowing from the Middle East to Europe now. Uh, he now lives in Greece. And every day, he goes to, the, to, to where the immigrants are processed and, and things like that, uh, to the refugee camps and, and sort of temporary places. And every day, he gives away bread. And he says that his son, that he is now, it's now his business partner, he talks to him and says, Dad, I, you know, it's good to help people, but not every day. And, and to him, he says, he says, I know, but I want to do it every day because I know how it felt to have nothing, right? So this man has a harvest, and he shares it, right? And I think it's interesting. I think the harvest is given to us, this blessing of God in whatever area, so that we can feed the you of yesterday. You know, it's given to us today so that we can feed the us of yesterday because we knew how it felt, right? Um, and I think that's how it feels to us, I think, in, in, as Christians because we, there's so much joy. I feel so much joy and passion about about speaking and teaching about this life, this new life that Jesus gives us. And the reason I feel that uh, is because I know how it feels to walk in the darkness. And, and it fuels me, right? And it fuels us, I think. And I think life in... in, in uh, th- what I love the most about this life in, in faith and in Jesus is that we get to sort of, instead of... What the, what the expected pattern of life is, is that we, um, we get older and we get more cynical or more disappointed, right? Or more weighed down and, and, and more unhealthy, you know? All of those things. Like it's sort of this slow dying, right, uh, as you get older. I think in Christ it's really cool because the opposite is true. You know, in, in, uh, as, as a Christian, as you get older... Uh, you feel, at least you're supposed to, if you, if you play your cards right, you feel more and more alive with every year. More and more alive and more, m- more joyful and more wise, right? And more energetic and all of those things. And I think part of it, maybe it's because Jesus get, helps us to uh, get over ourselves, right? You know, the, I, I heard someone say this really cool thing. I think it's very insightful that you spend your 20s and 30s really worrying about what people think about you, right? Uh, like really thinking about that a lot for some reason. And then once you hit 40 and 50, you stop caring. Uh, <laughs> you really stop caring about what people think about you. Uh, and then so, so the 40s and 50s should, should bring a little level of sort of a self-awareness and, and freedom and, and joy, right? And then when you hit 50s and 60s, that's like the golden age because you realize all of a sudden that actually people are not thinking about you that much anyway. Not because they don't care about you, but because life is just so overwhelming for everyone. And people really, quite frankly, don't think about you that often. And that's a, uh, I think it's a liberating thing. Uh, maybe it's a sad thing for you because you're worried what people are thinking about you right now. <laughs> so I give you a shortcut to, to a happy future. Um, but really the source... The source and, and purpose of, of a harvest is really twofold in Scripture, and it's really simple. And I love the simplicity of Scripture, and how it goes to the heart of things. So let's, 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 let's get that insight in, into this. James 1, 14, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. So everything good that happens in your life is from above. Coming down from the Father in the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In 1 Peter 4, 10, it gives you sort of what you do with that, Right? It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So it's very, very simple. The harvest is given to you from God. Any harvest, any good thing, any gift is from God. And any gift that you receive is best used to serve others. That's it. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Let me tell the story. This is a famous story from the Bible. And by the way, do you like our artwork uh, that matches the 100-acre woods? We use Winnie the Pooh b- backdrops because we can. 
<laughs> there's no other reason whatsoever. There's no deep spiritual reason. Uh, and I've, I promise actually to, to use uh, theological quotes from Winnie the Pooh. So here's one. Uh, Piglet, Piglet says, how do you spell love? Winnie, the Pooh, Winnie, how do you spell love? And Winnie says, um, you don't spell love, you feel it. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad, right? Winnie the Pooh theology, I love it. So there's a story, there's a story in, in the Bible that is, it's, it's really, it's just fantastic, right? It's just beautifully, it's, it's a real story and it, and, it's, and it appeals to us on so many levels and it has all kinds of layers to it and everything. And, and it's basically a story about Jesus entering this town called Jericho. And this is what happens. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through and a man there by the name of Zacchaeus he was a chief tax collector and wealthy. He wanted to see wh who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. I mean, just the imagery alone is really cool, right? This short guy, he just couldn't see over the crowd. He's very curious. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So uh, when he reached the spot, he looked up. So Jesus is walking, and this guy's on the tree, and he looked up and he goes, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So of all the people that were there, this crowd of people following Jesus, so much, there's so much of a crowd that you couldn't just see Jesus. You have to climb a tree to see, especially if you're short, right? So of all these people that are following Jesus, this adulation and this admiration and the healings and things like that, and he's a rock star, right? Uh, the, he picks up this one guy. He's short. He's eager at the same time. He's... He, he is despised, actually, because he's a tax collector, and th they were widely despised. Not only was he, he a tax collector, he's the, the boss of tax collectors. So, so he's like the, 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 the main man of tax collectors, right? Uh, the mafia boss. And uh, so he's on a tree. It's a little bit ridiculous and, and oddly touching, right? Uh, and, and Jesus points at him and says, you, I pick you, and I must stay at your house. And he says... The story goes on to say that he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And, uh, and I, I want to sort of stop and, and focus on this, on this particular um, moment because I present to you this one thing that I think helps us take advantage of the harvest and recognize it. And th this, this, is, this is the truth. There's, to get a harvest, at one point or another, you need to be able to eager to receive from somebody else's harvest. You know? Uh, you need to be eager to receive from somebody else's and be okay with it. And this is what happened to, 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 to Zacchaeus. See, you can be, actually, most fran uh, quite frankly, most of us are simultaneously in, one, in more than one place. We are simultaneously in a harvest and a flood and a drought. It's not binary. It's not zeros and ones, right? So all of us here have areas of life where we're in a drought, where things are just not going the way we want them to. And all of us are in, a, in an area of life or in a, in a flood where we are in over our head and we, there's a learning curve. It could be a good flood or a bad flood. Maybe you had a baby and you were in a flood. If you ever had a baby, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, uh, life, life, like the analogy of life being in over your head uh, and then there's a the flood of babies doing things, you know. And then there's always an area where you have a harvest. And I think the, the key to understanding this idea of harvest and how to use it well is to know that we're at the same time in a harvest and a drought at any given time. And the, have you noticed, like, give me, let me give you some proof. Have you noticed that, have you ever looked at somebody or even at yourself and go, how can you be so insightful in this area and so blind in this other area? Right? Or maybe thought about yourself that. You know, how can you be so happy and joyful and humorous and be at the same time so depressed just beneath the surface right how can you be so skillful and so clumsy at the same time uh, can you can, how can you be so brilliant 
in, in, in professionally is so dumb relationally, just horrible, making stupid things that people look at you and go, what are you thinking? What are you, you know? And the truth is, we're all like that. Every single one of us is like that. You know, we're at the same time in a, in a moment of drought and, 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 and lack of understanding of what to do with something and brilliant and wonderful in something else. So the key here is to understand what Zacchaeus did there. See, Zacchaeus had a drought. And the drought was a spiritual one. The guy needed Jesus. The guy needed to change his life. He needed to change his corrupt ways. He needed to change his devotion. He needed to give his heart to God. He hadn't before. And he was so eager that he climbed the tree. And he was so eager, even though people looked at him differently, that he accepted the, the harvest that was going, coming his way. Right? And that takes really great humility. And that's the beginning of a good harvest in the long, in the long run, that, isn't it? So, do you need babysitting in an area of life? Like, are you, are, you, are you courageous enough to say, you know what, I need a short leash on this one. I need someone to just walk, I need someone to hold my hand and come along, uh, alongside of me and walk me and walk with me and tell me what to do because I don't know what to do. Does that make sense? Are you willing to take that eagerly, right? You know, I, I remember when I, when I became a Christian, I, uh, I, I had all kinds of things aligned. In a, in, outwardly, it was actually a very harvest time for me, right? Uh, you know, professionally and things like that. I had a staff, I had a career, I was 26 years old. I was pretty, you know, things came together. And I was utterly miserable relationally, right? And spiritually, just totally lost, right? So I have this, this outward appearance of someone who knows what they're, you know, sort of has his act together. And then inwardly, I just needed someone to walk with me. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it was just horrible. And it felt so awkward. Um, and I think that's how we feel all the time. And, and, and what I want this community to be is this place where you can be weak and, and that's okay. Yeah? It's a place where you can, um, you can connect to people and say, look, I have this and this and this figured out but this gosh I just can you just tell me what to do what do you do who do I talk to who do I talk to um, and have someone look at you and go I know what, where you are and I've been there before and let me let me help you along the way and, and it can be all, all kinds of areas right and obviously primarily it's spiritual I know where you are if you're disappointed in, in so many people in, in, in are hurt in a weird way. It's hurt by, by religious people, right? By the experience of church. Disappointed in, in what happened. You know, some, whatever happened. And, and you have this, you're torn between wanting to believe and wanting to connect spiritually and believing in God and knowing that the Bible it speaks to you be, be, in spite of those hurts. And yet having these experiences that block your way forward. And I think it takes a lot of courage to say, you know what, I've, I'm, I'm disappointed in, in the way I did life in, in Christ or in church, uh, but I still want to figure it out, and will you help me? Right? Um, in any other area as well, I'm disappointed in relationships, and I, I still want to love and be loved. I want to learn how to be that way. I, I learn... I look at you, I look at this person and this person, and I go, you have it figured out. Can you tell me how? Can you take somebody else's harvest? Can you be eager as Zacchaeus was? You know, he could have said, oh, he could have not climbed the tree, first of all. That's the first sign of, of, the, of this eagerness, right? You, you go this extra step to learn. Um, you, you, you risk being looking foolish, in the eyes of, of, of people. You're worried about peop what people think about you and you just don't climb the tree. 
you know, you're embarrassed, you're paralyzed. He climbs the tree, right? And then when he's put in the, on the spot, in the middle of this big crowd, it says that he came down and eagerly opened his house, right? What does that even mean to welcome, uh, welcome this rabbi who was doing amazing things into your house in the midst of... It's a scandalous thing. It's, and, and so listen, listen to, to what happens next. It says that all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So they're criticizing Jesus here. And it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And I have cheated anyone out of anything. I will pay back four times the amount. Today, Jesus says to him, he says, Salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Ah, so this, this transition happens and, and Zacchaeus says, opens his house and comes down from the tree and people start to mutter because it's scandalous for a teacher, it, this moral teacher to, to come and, and, to, and to connect with someone who is despised, right? And then, and then Zacchaeus responds with, with something completely scandalous that no one expected. And he goes, I'll give, my, I'll give money away. I, have, I know I have a harvest. And this is an interesting thing. You never think of Zacchaeus as someone who has a harvest. But the truth is, the guy has a harvest. He's, he has worked. He has probably worked maybe immorally to a degree, right? But the guy has some skills, right? He's not only a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. And he has something to share. And he shares two things. He's trying to fix some wrongs because he says, if I cheated someone, I will return that. But he goes beyond the cheating. He says, half of everything I have, I'll just give away. Even if I haven't cheated you, I'll give it away. And I love this about him because he is in drought spiritually, but he's in harvest professionally. And as soon as, as, as you come in contact with the kingdom of God, you spring, if you connect, you want to instinctually, you know it in your heart that the only, the best thing you can do with a harvest that you have is to give it away. Whatever it is. It could be, it could be expertise. It could, in, his, in, in his case, it was money, right? He goes, I have money. I have a harvest. I'll serve, I'll serve this community with this money. There's another story where, to, where after... Uh, uh, the start of the church, the apostles were going towards the temple and this guy was begging them specifically for money, right? And he was a cripple and he, they basically said to him, we don't have any money, we have silver and gold, we don't have that harvest, but we do have something else, so why don't you get up and walk and heal the guy, right? The minute you, you, you feel a belonging to a community, you will feel a desire and an urging to share your harvest. Right? Whatever that is. And they just love about that, uh, that about God. That you can share. You can be, you can know, o know almost nothing about the Bible and about theology. And the minute you feel a belonging, you will start sharing whatever you have. Opening your house, being hospitable. If you're a good communicator, you start communicating. If you have expertise in whatever area, you feel the urge to do that. Right? I love that. And I think it helps us to understand, to identify the harvest when we know that we don't have to be, not everything will align all the time at all. As a matter of fact, most of the time, there's going to be a drought and a flood in one area or another. Don't wait. Don't get paralyzed by that. Don't get don't get accused by that. Look at your life and go, where's my harvest? And how can I share it? Does that make sense? And how can I share it? Um, when, I, when, I became a, when I became a Christian, like two years in, I started feeling that urge. And uh, because I, I knew I was a fairly good communicator. Uh, I was doing that in music and, and stuff like that. 
And I felt that urge that you can't resist um, to, to start speaking and, and, and leading. And because it, there was this little voice that says, I think you can do this well. Um, and then the other voice said, yeah, but I'm not going to, that's, it's not easy. And I already have a thing, you know. And um, I resisted that voice for a while, and then I couldn't any, mo- any longer. And I've never looked back. Um, but I love that God will speak to you. God will speak to you wherever you are, if you're, and, and you might not be even spiritually mature. I don't think I was very spiritually mature when I started speaking, or doing this, what I'm doing now, 18 years ago. There's so many things I needed to learn. There's so many things that I needed to repent of. And yet the voice was there, the calling was there, and it's hard to resist. You know? Um, and it, I think in this community, we, we want that to happen. We want you to share your harvest. What is it? Do you even believe that you have one? I think you have one. Every, every single person here has a harvest to share. And I want you to know, we want you to share it. And it could be baby steps, it could be small things or big things, or maybe more, more noticeable things and less notice, noticeable, noticeable things. Uh, but share it. Find a, find a place where you can pour out this harvest and bless other people. Right? We have all these, we have so many things that, are, that happen dur- during the week and that sort of, that overflows into a celebration on Sunday. But this is just the fruit, what we see here. If you're visiting, this is just the fruit. This excitement, this joy, this connection, these friendships, the, the thing that we have to actually kick people out of the building because they won't leave on their own. You know, um, um, that is just fruit of what happens when people share their harvest with each other throughout the week, right? So we have friendships and, and, and leadership and mentoring in small groups happening and we have a deaf ministry and we have a, the tech crew that comes in early every single Sunday and leaves after everybody else and when you're just full of joy and inspired after service they're the ones who can't even give hugs they start breaking down the, 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 the set right? and, uh, and um, we have so many people that are serving in, in so many different ways in, in the board, in Kick's Kingdom we don't even see them but they're taking care of our kids here there um, and there's, there's a thousand ways. By the way, we're looking for more people to do tech, for example, to do, to do video and, and to do all, all this stuff uh, because we need, to, we need to sort of spread the burden so people don't... We don't want anyone to be burdened, but everyone to have an opportunity to serve, right? Um, and when you come, please step forward and please say, I want to, I want to share my harvest and this is, this is my harvest. I love that sea ride when he came. He started playing bass even bef- before he became, uh, 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 be- before he was baptized. He was already worshiping in the band, right? Uh, and and we, we say that a lot. We want, we want you to belong before you become. And uh, he belonged. He felt the belonging. And he's like, he came and, and he started, uh, he actually came and, and said, hey, can I come to the rehearsal? I was like, sure, I can. I'll just, I want to just listen. I just want to s- sit, sit there. And so, so, so he came and he was uh, there. And then the band, I stepped away for like a minute. And the man was like, what are you doing up here? Come down here and worship with us. And, and he was, next thing I know, he's worshiping. I'm like, what happened, guys? And, and he goes, I don't know. It just happened, you know. And uh, it was wonderful, right? And what, that's what we want this community to be, a place that you can share your, your harvest, a place where you can even discover your harvest. Because oftentimes you walk around and you don't recognize it, and you have it, and it's wonderful, right? So we're going to take communion in just a minute. And uh, we, we take the, the, the cup, and we take the bread, and it's a celebration of something that happened, something very intimate that happened between Jesus and his disciples in the Last Supper. The cool thing about this, this story that Jesus asks us to remind ourselves of the story for some particular reason. I think the reason is because it has so many layers, and just underneath the surface, there's so much stuff that speaks to us. You know, and one thing that I love about the story is that when Jesus was having the supper, um, in, in Matthew 22, he says that he basically starts talking about betrayal. And he says, you know, the, the man who will dip his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Um, and then, of course, we re- we're reading this going, well, 
the man, it's, of course we know who that is, right? Uh, th there's this guy named Judas who was planning to betray. Uh, but the interesting thing about, I wonder if, if Jesus had something broader in mind. You know how in the Bible, th all kinds of things have two or three meanings, right? Um, because if you've ever been in, in a Middle Eastern meal, and uh, actually I had, I went to college, I had uh, college buddies, my room, uh, roommates were Middle Eastern. So we had these meals in the, in the, in, in the dorm all the time. And that's why I learned about it. And so they would basically cook this concoction. It was just delicious and smelly and awesome and spicy and like, like you know, things that you shouldn't cook in a dorm, basically, <laughs> you know, because it filled the hallway with all kinds of exotic smells. And they would bring this bowl. It was big, usually, you know, and they would bring the bowl. And then like five or six of us would sit there um, and we would, they would bring this bread, this flat bread, and we'd just pull it apart and we would, grab, we would all dip in the bowl and eat with our hands. That's how you eat in the Middle East. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if Jesus meant something broader when he was saying those words. Because most likely than not, that's how they were eating. There's not just one man who dipped his bread into Jesus' bowl. They were all dipping. And as a matter of fact, just a few verses later, he talks to them and he says this very night will all fall away on account of me. There was not just one betrayer. There was, only, there was, there were, there was a room full of betrayers. And the cool thing about th this, this meal that we share in remembrance of Jesus is that, quite frankly, we all betray. We all dip the hand. And yet we are fed by him anyway and forgiven by him anyway. And life has us oftentimes sort of convinced that because we fall short, because we have a drought and a flood and a pain and a brokenness about us, that means that we are broken. And that's the, the message of Jesus is the opposite of that. He will share his harvest with us even when we betray. And we should share our har harvest even if we're broken. So let's meditate on that and think about um, the blessing of a harvest, how we can pour it out into this community, into our friends, the people that we love. Amen?